Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Real History. As you all know, we have done a number of in-depth examinations of the iconic HBO series Band of Brothers on our channel. And this evening we are graced with the presence of one of the actors from that miniseries. And that is James Matteo, who of course plays Frank Perconi in the series. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you. I don't think I've ever heard the word I've been graced with the presence, but I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Especially with this background. All right. I've been graced. <laughs> we are here on the balcony of the Grand Hotel in Zellemse, Austria. And of course, if you are a fan of the series, uh, this hotel gets some screen time in episode 10, for it was the regimental headquarters of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. So as I joked with uh, Ross in our previous conversation. Uh, Colonel Sink could have wandered this very area throwing back a few. Right, I think about that often, especially on these tours and going to uh, you know, Normandy and, and St. Miraglis where, where Frank actually landed and, and places like where I know Frank was and I, I tend to think, did Frank walk these steps? Did Frank walk through this door? Did he touch this doorknob? Mm -hmm. So I often think that and I think that here right now. It's a great train of thought for our conversation, I think. Uh, so we have a uh, few uh, questions lined up for you. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you and the other actors have done a, a lot of interviews and you've done a lot of panel discussions and mm -hmm. great stuff like that. So I, I try to think of a few that perhaps other people haven't asked you. All right. uh, we'll, we'll start off with what's hopefully an easier one though. <clears throat> Out of all the interactions that you've had with fans of the show over the years, is there one that has been most meaningful or memorable to you? Wow, that's a good one. I think whenever I'm walking through an airport and I'll see a young soldier come walking down and we'll make that eye contact. And they'll look at me and kind of go, you look familiar, I know who you are, and they'll start to make a beeline for me. And they'll stick their hand out, and he or she will say, I just want to thank you for that series. It got me through some rough times when I was out in the field, the battlefield. And I think those are the most important to me, because they're looking at me as like some sort of celebrity or hero. And meanwhile, you know, I'm looking at them as the same, because they're celebrities and heroes to me. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I love when I interact with, uh, with soldiers. I think that's always a great thrill and a big reward for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a shout out to our viewers. Uh, James has done a really great interview with the American Veterans Center that you can likewise find on YouTube. And I, I think you share a lot of really great insight along those lines mm -hmm. in that interview. So well done. So, of course, you had to do a lot of research to get into character for right. Frank Perconi. And um, unlike Ross with Liebgott, your veteran was still alive. Mm -hmm. And that had a transformative impact on you. Mm -hmm. So perhaps you can outline some moments where his commentary led to some changes in the script and the further development of your character. Yeah, right, well, I, I've said this a lot, especially on tours and, and speaking with fans. Uh, when I first contacted Frank, obviously, you know, we just want to know some of the basics. How'd you keep a uniform? Did you smoke? Did you curse? Did you drink? Who were your best friends? All of that stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think for Frank, I kind of didn't really truly get to know him until after the series. So when I watch the series, um, I always feel this urge of, I could have potentially gotten Frank better, mm. more who Frank was. Mm. Uh, but, you know, the tidbits, a lot of tidbits that he gave me, you kind of had to find out from the other veterans because they don't really talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. So I would talk to, you know, uh, Frank John Hughes who played Garnier. I'd talk to Donnie Wahlberg who played Lipton and Rick Gomez, you know, played George Luz, who was, you know, in touch with uh, George Luz Jr. And I would ask them, do you have any information on Frank? Because every time I'm speaking to him, he tends to bring up all of his best friends in the, in the company. You know, Frank rarely sort of spoke about himself. And I think that's, that's kind of sort of the, the cadence with all those men. They tend to not talk about themselves. Mm -hmm. Are there any scenes that you can recall that were cut? Or are there any uh, anecdotes or incidents that you think should have been included? 
You know what? I was talking with Ross about this today. We were on the bus coming back from uh, the Eagle's Nest. And we sat next to each other and we were watching uh, the film and we, the ending of the film and uh, the end of episode 10 and the conversations with the, with the real men. And once it ended, I looked over to Ross and I said, wouldn't it be amazing if they put out like a 25th anniversary what bonus interviews with these men they have to be out there mm -hmm. they have to be out there so i would love to see what they have on the cutter room floor within the film and also some of the information that maybe these men are letting us know for me personally uh you know maybe i got lucky i didn't land on the cutting room floor so i wouldn't be able to answer that i mean <laughs> I, you know i don't want to say i wish i could I'm glad I can't answer that, but uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't land on the, on the cutting room floor. And I'm not so sure I could recall much that did not make the script. Um, I'd be curious to know what Ross said. Uh -huh. did, did Ross say something that make it? Ross uh, recalled uh, a scene from episode nine where there was some sort of a monument to Hitler and people were spitting on it mm. um, and he said that was taken out just because the filmmakers thought it was rather superfluous Wow no I did not know that okay. I did not know that that's good to know but I could understand why you take that out at that yeah. time in the film and where you're concentrating on you know uh -huh. uh, so I could I, I could understand them pulling that okay yeah, yeah. well speaking of onset stories were there any particularly dangerous moments on set where you know, something was going off or a pyrotechnic was here or there? And is there any, any moment where you actually felt in danger? It felt like it was a combat zone? Well, the only time I felt in danger was actually off camera by Neil McDonough, who played Compton. Because <laughs> he was a Boston guy and I was a New York guy. We would go at it quite often. You know, we'd play really rough. And, and one time he was taking a nap in his trailer where, uh, you know, we didn't, we weren't, in, you didn't go in your trailer because if you did, you know, we'd sort of make fun of you. And Neil decided to sneak away and fall asleep in his trailer. And I attacked him while he was sleeping. He didn't like that. So he chased me around the entire uh, parking lot and all around the trailers. And when he finally got me, he threw me in nettles. And my whole body sort of <laughs> swelled up. No, you know, as far as on camera and, and actual shooting, I think in episode three, there was a point when I was firing my M1. Uh, when the Shermans and, and when, we, when Shermans before the Shermans came over in episode three actually, uh, and George Lodge Rick Gomez is to the right of me, and I remember firing my M1, and the shell popped out and just went right down his shirt, and I remember him going like yelling, and I I just thought he was doing it for the camera. I was like, wow, that's great work. You're excited <laughs> that the Shermans are coming, <laughs> but I think one of my shells went down his shirt and was burning his skin. I never felt any danger personally but you know i've witnessed some dangerous stuff i think we spoke about it on the bus about the tank mm. rolling over the guy in in the, in the same battle uh that stuntman getting ran over by an actual tank and having me pushed into foam was pretty impressive to watch that absolutely stunned me every time i watched that i thought for sure i all oh, those are styrofoam treads or this is some sort of no. fiberglass vehicle that's absolutely terrifying right which more terrifying is they had to do take two on it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so imagine being the stuntman getting ran over and then uh you know them going cut all right we need another one take two <laughs> i hope he got a nice bonus i'm sure he did they yeah. always do uh, on a more somber note, mm -hmm. uh, also in episode nine, mm -hmm. all of the actors have said that they they refused the opportunity to see the set of the Landsberg concentration camp in advance because you wanted the reaction to be real and visceral. What was going through your mind the first time you saw that set? Well, we all were in agreement that we kind of didn't want to see the set. Uh, I had to rehearse the Jeep coming down with uh, Nixon and Winters and being in that Jeep. And I had to rehearse cutting the fence uh, with, the, with the cutters. Uh, so I had seen it prior to it being dressed. And dressed meaning uh, uh, the actors and the extras were not there. The smoke wasn't there. Some of the uh, bodies were not laying down on the floor. Uh, so I had seen it undressed, but I rehearsed it. And I remember being uh, really taken back by it. And then when we rolled camera and you actually seen the set in its whole, you know, 
I think that we all felt the impact of this show. Each and every one of us just could not believe what we were seeing. The attention to detail and what they had created and what we are seeing. It almost felt real. The one thing that obviously was, you know, that, that they would always remind us was uh, uh, the stench and devastation. Right before they said action, they would tell everybody, do not forget the stench and the devastation of what you're seeing right now. Yeah, tough, tough set to be on, for sure. Mm -hmm. Tough, tough set to be on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all knew it. I mean, we all know it. We took it, took it very, very seriously. And those, uh, those actors, man, bless them, they, they worked really hard. And uh, that, that's not an easy right. job for them to come to set every day and see that. And remember, it takes like a month to film something. So you're seeing that, you're around that for a month, witnessing that every mm -hmm. morning, uh, getting into that character every morning and staying there 12 to 16 hours a day, seeing it. So, you know, yeah. it's affected everybody. There's no doubt it really did. And, you know, that's, the episode does that each time I watch it as well. Absolutely. My, uh, I took a Holocaust class when I was in college and our professor showed us that episode. And it certainly leaves its mark on mm. young people, rightfully so. Mm. And it's, it's a good platform for conversation that episode. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important conversation. It could be confusing to young kids as well who are yeah. just living in a video game and mm -hmm. living in a television and a phone and a computer. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you kind of go, well, this, this is what happened just 80 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's important for the younger generation to understand. It's Amen. Repeat history. Amen. So that was filmed in England, as was most of the series. Um, but earlier today, you answered a question that I was always curious yeah. about. And that's the episode that takes place in Austria. A lot of people wonder, well, are those mountains CGI? Did you film that in England too? What, what's the answer? We shot that in Interlaken, Switzerland. So the entire production, the entire crew moved location to another country, Interlaken, Switzerland, which was a lot of fun. It was a breath of fresh air. It was different. You know, we felt like it was coming to the end of our production. I know it sounds silly to think it, that the war was coming to an end, but our, our production was ultimately getting close to an end. We could see the finish line, think about getting home, you know, eat, eating some home cooking, sleeping in our beds. Uh, but yeah, it was wonderful. I mean, Interlaken was a, a warm welcome. We had a lot of fun. Obviously, you got the lake, uh, you know, we, we, were, we were playing baseball. You know, these scenes were much, much different than being in a concentration camp. Now we're you know, hey guys, I want to watch you play baseball for three innings. Enjoy yourself. You know, or hey, Winters, you got to jump in a lake a few times. You know, it just <laughs> seemed like, uh, you know, a great place to be. It was a wonderful, wonderful place to be. And we tore it up <laughs> a little bit. Sorry, Interlaken. We got your letters. <laughs> well, I, I think that too is a, a good uh, connecting point to our next question. This one's actually from one of our viewers, one of mm. our faithfuls, Dave Mack. Dave, thanks for tuning in. All right, Dave, better be a good one. <laughs> uh, and he wondered, for you American actors who were living in the UK for a year, what sort of interesting culture shock was there? Oh, well, the, culture, the, the first culture shock is when I walked out onto the curb and I almost got hit by a car because I'm looking the opposite direction. <laughs> and Rick Gomez, who played Loves, Love, Loves, saved my butt. That was the first culture shock. The second culture shock was their breakfast, the boiled tomato with the baked beans and fat piece of ham and the wet eggs. I didn't understand that. That was a huge culture shock to an Italian boy from New York. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I enjoyed that, that city. I just thought it was a big, clean city that, that, that did it right. I really did. I enjoyed the culture, uh, uh, the etiquette. Uh, and I did enjoy the food. I know I make fun of the breakfast, but I did enjoy the food. I thought the people were very warm. The accommodations were fantastic. So I enjoyed England. I, each, each time I go back to London, I, you know, the memories start to kick in, you know? Like this street, me and Rick on our days off, we'd take a bike. I, like we bought a bike just for like 10 months. We knew we could never take it home. But we bought a bike for 10 months and we'd go bike riding. And then we'd go like find like a handball court or a tennis court. and and play tennis and we would stop in a pub and oh, let me go, you know, go back and, and read lines or just, you know, watch a movie or, you know, hang out and cook dinners. I mean, it was just a, it was a magnificent time, you know, mm -hmm. really, really wonderful time. That's great. Yeah. This question's from Kelly and she asks, 
Was there anything you felt uncomfortable portraying on screen? Were there any scenes that went, shall we say, a bridge too far? Did you? I, I know you expressed this a little bit. Did, did you? Mm. Is there anything where you felt, oh, maybe Frank wouldn't have done this, or? Yeah, obviously, when I watch it now, there's and getting to know Frank uh, over the years before he passed, you know, post show. Uh, I, you know, I would have loved to pull back on the cursing. The F-bombs, Frank was not that type of guy, so uh, every time I hear myself or watch an episode and I hear him, you know, drop an F-bomb or any kind of curse, I kind of cringe. I just know mm -hmm. that that's kind of not him. Uh, I don't know if Frank would have been as rough with the replacement mm -hmm. as I was, but there's a lot of things I'm very proud of that I, that I found out before we shot, that I got to speak to Frank, which is what, you know, he did not drink and he did not smoke cigarettes. And I think those are really big things. And he kept himself tidy uh, and clean and, uh, you know, respected all the men. So I'm, I'm, I'm proud that I got to talk with him and, and translate that on the screen. Mm -hmm. that, that was very important to me. I have one final question for right. you before we uh, wrap up. I kind of ambushed Ross with this one, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose. So I'll, I'll be more direct uh, for you. But the the camaraderie between the actors who played these men, it seems as often as great as the men themselves who you portray. And uh, a, a dream of mine would be to see y'all back on screen together. <laughs> and, uh, and I think a great way to do that would be to have a little easy company movie set during a reunion in like the 1960s or 1970s. <laughs> yeah, have that's... all the actors and you, you've, you've aged naturally along with uh, the men who you're playing. I think it'd be a wonderful closure for a lot of viewers who love the show. <laughs> well, um, I'd say first yeah. off, go pitch that to HBO and, <laughs> and play Tony. If you listen, I think that's a wonderful pitch. I would love to work for you guys again and play uh, you know, my hero, Frank Percanti. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a great idea, but, you know, obviously, uh, we all keep in touch. Yeah. And uh, we tend to, if we can and it works out and it's not wedged in, we will put each other in each other's films. Yeah. If we can. Uh, but our camaraderie, as you've seen with me and Ross, and, and as you've watched in, in, in some of these interviews that the World War II Museum did at the symposium, uh, our camaraderie is... is, is documented. I mean, it is strong. Everybody knows it. Uh, I mean, nothing to what Shifty said in the final moments on, mm -hmm. on the episode about their camaraderie and their brotherhood and, 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 uh, and how they knew each other. But, you know, we became as close as you could ever become during that production and after that production. And we are extremely proud of that, and we wear that on our sleeve heavily, and we know the importance of it. And we love more than anything, anything, that the audience and the public know how strong our bond is, mm -hmm. and that we're always there for each other. And uh, yeah, that's very important to all. Most that. definitely shows. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, well, as you can, I mean, as yeah. you can imagine. I mean, for me, it was my college years. I was in my early 20s, I never went to college. And those guys were all my big brothers, you know? Mm -hmm. The Neils, the Rons, the Damians, the Liptons, the Ron Livingston, I mean, uh, Frank John Hughes, all of them. They were all my, my big brothers, all my, all my brother. I mean, each and every one of them. It's a great note to end on. Yeah. James, thank you so much thank for joining much. us. Thank you all, appreciate that. All thank right. You yeah. Thank you for tuning in to this episode where your host is dramatically underdressed in comparison <laughs> to his guest. Uh, but thank you nonetheless. We appreciate all of your helpful comments and tuning into all of our Band of Brothers content. Until we see you next time, stay curious.